And um, so I'd like to share something today, uh, my meditation, and I hope it can help devotees in their Krishna consciousness. Uh, so today's topic I thought I could talk about is Hanuman. And uh, I spoke about rediscovering your super, your original superhero. So when you were growing up, how many of you actually had a superhero that they kind of liked? Would you like to share? My superhero was um, actually Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, nice. Mm -hmm. oh, that's very spiritual. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I, I thought she was going to say Spider Man. Yeah. Or <laughs> Spider -Man. But uh, anyone else? Yes, some Dutch one. My superman was my father. Oh. Okay, let's see. You guys are too deep for me, man. <laughs> okay, so your father was your superhero, right? Okay, good. Anyone else? Yes, Rishi Bru. Okay, here's a funny one, but this is an honest truth. My superhero. Was Superman when I was a child, and I put my mom Shalom <laughs> I tried to jump out the window, <laughs> and my dad caught me, and I was really trying to jump out the window. You're actually going to jump out the window? I thought I was it. Is Lina Shakyamaji here? She knows about this. Oh, she does. Okay, good. Anyone else? Any any favorite superhero heroes when you were growing up? Oh, she didn't want to. <laughs> yeah, I was a bit confused if you put your hand up. Okay, anyways. Yes, uh, um, yes. Sachi Mata. Yeah, there was a discarded figure was called Super Brilliant, right? And he had the super sight, and everything was there, and he was bigger, only totally. Sport Beanie! Yeah, everyone knows about that, right? <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> Mine was a TV hero guy who came on the screen and said, I have the power! <laughs> what, are they hearing this, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, yes, from which group? Kung Fu Panda. Kung Fu Panda, okay, nice. I knew I was Yes. Your grandparents, okay, sweet, super. So what is it about superheroes that we find so attractive? Why is it that we find these superheroes so attractive? Powerful. They're very powerful. So power is a feature that find we, we're quite attracted to. What else? They solve all the problems. If there's a problem, they have the answer. Yes, so superheroes are attractive because they solve problems in life, but for example? Someone that you can look up to. Someone that you can look up to. Push, you said? They're strong, right? It's another feature that's very attractive. Anything else? Amazing feats. They have? Amazing feats. They can do amazing things. They can do amazing things. Good. They're not ordinary. Yeah, they're extraordinary, aren't they? Yeah. You can count on them. That's a good one. You can? You can count on them. You can count on them. Okay, because they're reliable. Sweet. They're always on the right of the right thing. Not righteous. Bad, righteous. Righteous. Yeah. They're very righteous. Yeah. Okay, so again, they're very attractive. So, Madashi? Yeah, they're nice qualities. They have good qualities, right? So superhero is very interesting. We find it very attractive. You know, they have wonderful qualities and we're inspired by it. And all these superheroes that we grow up to, um, look, look to, they're fictional characters. You know, like you look at X-Men, Spider-Man, they have all these super uh, powerful features. But there's one personality that's always underlooked is Hanuman. When you look at Hanuman's stories, his upbringing, and you know, it's that he actually represents um, amazing qualities, and there's so much we can learn um, from his life, his examples. And I thought today it would be nice to kind of dissect uh, different stories of Hanuman and lessons that we can actually utilize in order to overcome different difficulties that we have in life, which is the theme for today's seminar, uh, this, this today's um, workshop. So we're going to talk about Hanuman. Um, and like I said, stories have entertained and educated civilizations for centuries. Okay? Uh, so today what we're going to do is we're going to look at one specific topic which is uh, very important to discuss in society and also it is a topic that's something that I've been kind of working on for a long time. And that topic is negativity. Okay? And we're going to actually look at uh, what lessons can we learn from Hanuman to help us overcome negativity. So first of all, how many of you ever go through negativity? Really? <laughs> like you guys look all positive and like, you know, all this positive vibe I'm getting. What's that? That's you reflecting back. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's very nice, but it's a bit cheesy. 
And I think it's unvegan. <laughs> That's my cheese is awesome. Okay, negativity, right? Do we all go through negativity? When you look at your life, how often do you go through negativity? Every day? Every moment? Much too often. Very often. How does, it make, too often. how does that affect the quality of your life? Badly. Very bad, right? <laughs> is, is it a nice life you live when we're surrounded by negativity? No. Absolutely not. They say negativity. In fact, they say World Health Organization actually claims that the biggest cause of illness and disease in modern day society is what? Men mental illness. You know, a suicide's on the rise. It's mentioned that no one kills themselves because of physical pain. They kill themselves because of mental pain, right? And even though we've advanced so much in society, we have so much facility, so much conveniences, yet, why is it that mental illness is on the rise, right? So this is a very relevant topic in our society nowadays. And, and even as devotees, like, this is something that can also affect your practice, isn't it? When we're negative, are we fired up about our sadhana? That's probably the first thing we want to give up, isn't it? So it's very important to actually understand what is negativity, where does it originate from, and how can we overcome it? Is that okay? Is this quite relevant for you guys? Yeah. Yeah? So we're going to dissect this concept. We've got... What time are we supposed to finish? One of these. I'm very optimistic. It's just the way you see it. So we've got about one hour, so this is going to be very interactive. We've got loads of exercise that we want you guys to do, um, and we're going to learn from each other, actually. Okay? So what I want to do is I want you guys to get into your groups, and I want you to discuss three questions. Okay? And these are the three questions. The so first question is, what are the biggest testing moments in your life? Okay? I want you to reflect. What's the biggest testing moment that you've gone through, or maybe you're going through, or maybe you will go through in the future? Okay? Second thing is, what emotions did you go through and how did this affect the quality of your life? Okay, I want you to become aware and conscious of negativity. You know, what were the emotions you went through and how did it affect the quality of life? Most importantly, what methods did you use to overcome negativity? Is that clear? Yeah, yeah? so I'll give you guys about five minutes to speak to the person next to you or whoever you want to speak to and discuss these three topics, uh, three questions, and then we're going to regroup and then discuss it further. Um, Thank you for sharing. Would anyone like to share a testing moment that they went through no. in life? No. If it's not too personal. <laughs> yes, Nila Chakra. Well, as you know, I've got a picture of my son when he was born. You cannot hear. Oh, brother, I think they want you to come up front. <laughs> <laughs> you can stand up. You can, you can stand up and just shout if that's okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, you can just shout from there. It's fine. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, my when my son was born with uh, learning disabilities, um, I, that was like I couldn't, couldn't understand, make any sense of it. Um, that was yeah. It was a really big testing moment. Oh, I had to change everything and. The emotions you go through, hopelessness, you know, dreading the future, um, affects the whole family. But <clears throat> methods to overcome, start looking to Krishna more, took it more deeply, try to understand why these things happen, and obviously being surrounded by such a wonderful devotee now, I'm slowly learning to deal with it and try to use it in a Positive way. Okay, nice. So dependence on Krishna was your way of dealing with overcoming such negativities. Yeah. Sweet. Uh, can you scribe? Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> She's got a neatest handwriting, so sorry. <laughs> no pressure, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's empty. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Would anyone like to share anything? If, if it's too personal, then at least you can go through the emotions. Yes, you did. So dependency on Krishna, way to deal with it. The biggest testing moment in my life was when I had to give up my child uh, in custody to my ex-husband and leave and begin a new life in America. 
That was the biggest testing moment of my life. Mm-hmm. And what was the emotion that you went through? Oh my goodness, you don't want to know. No, no, we do, we do. <laughs> <laughs> Everything <laughs> possible. I want to jump off. I want to end my life. I want to finish this. What's the use of living anymore? Does my life have any meaning? What's the purpose of... I mean, I, di- I wasn't even Krishna conscious. I didn't know the philosophy. I didn't know anything. So it was really very rough. And the one, most wonderful thing is, I came to Krishna Consciousness through all those trials and tribulations. Okay, wonderful. And your, your coping mechanism? Crying. Oh, okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay so if you're stressed out, you're negative, just cry it out. <laughs> Good. Talking to people, talking to friends. Okay, so talking yeah. to people and friends helped you. Yeah. Okay, sweet. See, one of the reasons why we're doing this is because devotees go through different, uh, same struggles, but everyone has different coping mechanisms. And what I've realized is by discussing these topics, you will discover new coping mechanism which you've never thought about before. You know, and that's the reason why we're doing this. And I find this very useful. So when I, whenever I go through or struggles I go through life, I ask other devotees, do you go through it? Yes. What's your coping mechanism? And then when I find out what their coping mechanism is, I will use it in my life and it actually works. You know, so it's a very powerful technique, uh, you know, we kind of use to discuss this and churn it, you know. Anyone else? Any few uh, coping mechanisms? Yes, Mother Rain. So she felt the most loneliness and sadness when her husband left the body. Uh, so it's uh, you find yourself hopeless and uh, you don't know how to go out of this situation out and how to move forward. So she had this, uh, she was happy that her children were in the process of Krishna consciousness. And they had the spiritual master of Guru Maharaj. And so she joined them. And she asked Guru Maharaj, can she be her disciple? <laughs> yeah, okay, sweet. So for you, spirituality helped you in overcoming negativity. Sweet. Okay. Mother Rohini is very kind. You know, uh, when we uh, when we tri- they did a Harinam party. Myself and Maharaj, we stayed at a house, beautiful house by the way, if anyone's around that town, do visit it. <laughs> of course, ask permission first. <laughs> it's beautiful near the beach, so really nice. Um, so yeah, so thank you for sharing that. Um, oops, I don't know if I should have said that. Uh, it's okay, okay. Well, she, she's a great cook by the way. Yeah, I just remember the ravi- ravioli that you made for us, you know. I'm waiting for the next invite. <laughs> Thank you. Any any other any other negative motion, Kush? Yes. Oh, when I was a, when I was in my life, when I was a kid, more family that like, looked after me, was being helping Krishna and look after other people and making me happy on me. It's nice. So helping others makes you happy. Yeah. Okay. Nice. So maybe that's another thing: contribution or or doing something for others. Okay. Uh, why don't we just skip to what methods can we use to overcome negativity, do you think? We just want to come up with a list of loads of things, so this is something you can practically take away with you, and this is your toolbox. Next time you're going through all these emotions, go to this toolbox. Yes, uh, Sachin Madhavan and I think the one thing that helped me the most with this negativity is that I first accept the situation that is in front of me. Do not try to reject it or to be angry with it. Just, you know, cope with it, you know, first accepting, and then, of course, um, that opens up so many different views on the same situation. You know, usually when I have this negativity, I'm quite blocked. I don't see out. You know. Thank you. That's a really powerful point, acceptance. Many times we're in a situation, we're in denial. And generally, that's one of the biggest problems, first block that we need to get rid of. 
So acceptance is the first thing that we should do, right? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's really important to share. Because okay. some people are quite fine. We're all individuals. Uh, very, very, very important to share amongst each other what we're going through. Right. And speak to each other, mm -hmm. share, open up your emotions, discuss. And, and you know, by showing us we all going to help each other and, and, and give you the right method. That's, that's a really, again, an amazing point. I have a friend who's a doctor, and we were discussing that, uh, you know, how his work, what's with, what his work like, and we're talking about this topic. And he told me that. So many times people come to my surgery, my practice, with mental problems, right? And he says that, you know, um, most of the time I can get rid of the negativity and the depression that they're going through by just hearing them out. Just by hearing them out, they can go away. But he goes unrestricted. I have a pressure of seeing 40 patients in a day, which means I can only spend 10 minutes per, 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 per patient. And therefore I have no choice but to prescribe antidepressant tablets to these patients. You know, and so therefore he actually said that all they need to do is just be heard, and when they just speak it out, the negativity and depression goes away. You know, so that's a really nice point of sharing. Do you have your hand up? Yeah, I'll just, uh, I think my mother did cover it, but uh, when you are devotee, I think you can turn that into positivity by uh, by accepting it as Krishna's mercy. You know, mm -hmm. saying it's happening for a reason, whether it's due to my past deeds or whatever. Mm -hmm. That's really nice as well. Like sometimes what we see negativity is just based on our perspective. When you expand your consciousness and your awareness, that same negativity actually has the potential of becoming positivity. But you have the right perspective to look at it. Okay? And so this is what I wanted to dissect a little further because I actually this is one of the uh, topic that's been in my mind for uh, for a long time. Okay, first of all, thank you, Eta. Beautiful, very nice. We'll frame it. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I'd like to share with you guys One of the most challenging testing moments in my life Was most of you know two years ago Okay, I had a severe stomach pain in my, in my stomach I was, I was in the marathon in 2016 And there were times when like, I couldn't do anything Because I had so much bad stomach pain um, And the pain would only go when I'd throw out Throw everything out was in my system you know? And it was very severe I became very sick I became very anemic I had to go up and merge into blood transfusion. They did a scan, and in 2017, this is what they found. So this is a picture, actually, of my scan showing a tumor in my colon, all right? So in 2017, January 2017, 24th of Jan, was when the doctors actually told me I was diagnosed with stage three colon cancer, okay? Now, this was a very um, a turning point in my life because, you know, life was great up till this point. I never had any health crisis, I never had to go and see a doctor because my health was great. In fact, when I was at the hospital, they asked me, oh, who's your GP? And I said, I actually don't know who my GP is because I never had to visit him. You know, I had, um, you know, healthy lifestyle and when something like this happens, it's like, it's a shock. And one of the things I struggle with, such as I can relate to, was denial. I thought maybe they got something wrong in the scans, you know? And I, I was in a denial phase. I even tried to cry. You know, because that's your strategy, isn't it, Sashim? Um, Ashida Imaji. Cried out. So I was trying, nothing came out. I remember the last time I cried was when my favorite football team lost in 1998. <laughs> it was Arsenal. I was emotional. I was an emotional wreck. You know? Um, that was the last time. So then the doctors told me that um, because of your tumor, you also aggravated tuberculosis. So I had, I had TB at the same time. And um, it was very interesting because the doctor said that. Uh, you're going to have to take medication for your TB, go through surgery, chemotherapy, etc. This is me before the surgery. You must... <laughs> I look very happy. Uh, one of the reasons is because I never thought I'd look so cool in the hospital gown. Um, I thought I could, I could model for this, you know? Um, but they didn't put up to the offer. This is me after the surgery. And you can see I look quite happy there as well. And, and the reason why is because you see this blue button here? It is when you click it, it releases morphine. <laughs> <laughs> and oh my god, I was high. <laughs> I was blissed out. I was thinking, I, I, this actually gave me the impetus to chant Hare Krishna because I thought this is what ecstasy must be like. <laughs> yeah. So this is, this is me after my first surgery. Uh, and and uh, Maharaj also came visit me, so that was really nice. I was even extra happy. Uh, Haridas Thakur came and, and it was really nice, you know, Maharaj came, uh, showed support. Um, and this is also another patient we met in the hospital. 
Um, he was like 98 years old, you know, and then we just started talking. Marge gave him a book and he blessed him as well. <laughs> His life is successful now, you know. Um, and so this was a very long journey I had to go through. This is in the chemo ward. So my, my, my treatment after my surgery, I had to go for eight cycles of chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is that they actually go in the chemo ward. You see the red bag? That's actually the chemochemical that they inject into your veins. You sit there for four hours, and this is me, quite excited, and then I'm dead. You know, because it just drains you out like anything. Um, at the same time, I was taking about 30 pills every single day for six months. I'm popping pills all the time. Because I had to take treatment for cancer and tuberculosis, you know. And then, so after eight cycles, it was all over. The doctors, the scan said it's all clear, you know. And I took six months to recover. You know, I was in good shape. I went to India. I did a yoga teacher's training course. And I was feeling really good. And I went for my next scan. And unfortunately, the doctor said the, the tumor had spread to my liver. So then I had to go for a liver surgery. This is me. I asked the surgeon, can you take a picture? Because I'm knocked out, so I don't know what's everything like. You know, uh, this is me there, that's my surgeons and uh, the junior nurses, <laughs> you know, and there's me next to see. <laughs> so when this happened, I, I realized that, oh gosh, I could go through the whole cycle again. So the, they, they chopped like uh, almost half of my liver. They said you can function on half of your liver, but liver regenerates. So don't worry, if you have to lose your liver, it comes back, so you can relax. That's what the doctors told me. Um, so after that, I had to start chemotherapy again. I said, oh, great, I have to go through the whole concept again, you know? Uh, so I, I began another arduous um, cycle of chemotherapy. Um, and then my next scan, they said, potentially the cancer has spread to your lungs, you know? So I said, oh, great, here we go again. But what happens is, when you go through this negativity and you have a good support system, you become desensitized to all this, and this becomes part of life. You have the ability to deal with it. But one of the things I went through was these negative emotions. I went through all of this in the last two years, from anger to low self-esteem, lethargic, uh, depression, loneliness. You know, this was the worst because you're in your room, you're meant to be resting, but that's probably the worst advice you can get because what do you do is you and your mind, mm. you know? Um, frustration, confusion, you're disappointed, you're stressed, mood swings. Now, I'm an easygoing guy, but during this period, I go through a lot of mood swings. You can ask my parents, you know? Um, sometimes you don't want to eat, there's lots of independence, a lot of negativity, you know? And the good thing is, I had a great support system. I had great, amazing devotees, family, friends, and Krishna consciousness was a key element to helping me deal with this, you know? And the reason why I'm sharing this is that you don't need to go through cancer or have some terminal illness to go through these emotions. Do you go through these emotions? Mm -hmm. yeah. So we're all in the same boat, okay? And so what I wanted to do is today I'd, I'd like to share with you what techniques or methods help me deal with overcoming negativity, okay? And, um, and that's what I'll be sharing with you guys. Um, and this is, this is quite interesting. So when I was going through my treatment, I was bedridden in one sense. I did a lot of reading. It was a perfect time to do a lot of reading. And one of the first book I read was this one. Have you seen this book? Chronicles of Hanuman. It's an amazing book because um, it really just tells you amazing, fascinating stories and also life lessons from that, you know? And so today what I'd like to do is I'd like to share with you four lessons I extracted by reading the past times of Hanuman. Is that okay? Yeah. You know, and hopefully if this helps you, great. Okay, and I call this, um, so before I go into that, let's just talk a little about Hanuman, okay? The birth of Hanuman. Um, it's quite mystical. Does everyone know how or the mystical aspect of Hanuman's birth? Obviously he had a mother and father, yeah. his first step, okay? So the story is quite interesting. I've heard many different versions, so I'll share with you what I know. So the first version I hear is Dasarat Maharaj. When he was, he, he wanted to have a child, he performed the yagya. Remember that? In the yagya, what happens? A personality comes with pasay, pasayam, or it's like, uh, it's like it's called nectar. Right? And what did Dasra do? He took a third book of it, gave it to one of his wives. He took a portion of it and gave it to each one of his wives. Mm -hmm. The last portion, he was about to give it to his wife, Sumitra. By that time, what happens? A big eagle comes. Who's that? Garuda. Garuda comes, he snatches this pot, remaining nectar in the pot, and then he flies away. He flies away to a place called Kishkinda. Do you know where that is? It's somewhere in India. <laughs> 
that would be in Saudi Arabia, I'm just so in India. Kishkinda is a place where there was one great personality, she was meditating. Who was that? Anjana. Anjana was meditating because she wanted to have a child. As she was meditating, Garuda dropped this um, nectar in on her lap and then she ate it and this is how Hanuman was born. Okay, that's one of the stories. Second story I heard was one day Lord Shiva was meditating. In his meditation, he was chanting Ram, Ram, Ram. Next to him was uh, Sati, Mother Sati. Okay, and when Lord, when Lord Shiva opened his eyes, um, he told Sati that, okay, Hanuman's going to be taking birth soon and he's instructed all the demigods to take birth and help him assist in defeating this demon, Ravan. So Mother Sati was quite upset. She goes like, my dear Lord, whenever you're with me, you're meditating and when you're awake and conscious, you're traveling around and performing service. I never get time to actually associate with you. So then they came up with the deal that Lord Shiva was going to become a monkey and then Sati would also become a monkey and then this is how she would get to spend time and serve the Lord. Now it's very interesting, Mother Sati asked an interesting question to Lord Shiva. He told, she told Lord Shiva that you're the one who gave all the power to Ravan and now you want to go and defeat him. It's quite interesting, isn't it? Like you gave the power to Ravan and now you want to defeat him, it doesn't make sense. So Lord Shiva made an interesting point. He goes that Ravan pleased 10 different forms of Lord Shiva and that's why he's got 10 heads and he had all that power but he offended one of the Shivas, the Rudra form. And so when I take this incarnation, it's actually going to be the Rudra form, and that's the form that he uses to defeat Ravan. Does that make sense? Right? So actually, the union between Mother Satya and Lord Shiva became a conception, and that conception was given to Vayu, and then Vayu then gives it to Anjana, who then becomes uh, Vayu Putra. So Lord Hanuman is actually uh, manifested incarnation of Lord Shiva, that is the son of Vaidya. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah? So this is like just a bit of the history of Hanuman, or how he took birth, basically. Uh, interesting thing is, how did Hanuman become so powerful? Does anyone know? How is it that he's so powerful? What are his powers? He's strong. He's strong, yes. He can fly. What was that? He can fly. He can fly? Marge? Yes. So this is a really beautiful story, how he got benediction. So Lord, when Hanuman was a child, he was very hungry. So what does he do? He wants to eat. I mean, you can imagine this child, right? He, he saw the sun and he thought it was some kind of a fruit. Imagine your child saying that. What would you say to that? It's quite bewildering, isn't it? And you can't eat the sun. How do you explain that? <laughs> right? But Hanuman wanted to. And so what he does is he actually was so powerful um, that he actually swallowed the sun. He actually ate the sun. So there was big havoc in the heavenly planets. Everything was very dark. Everyone was trying to figure out what's happening. And then the demigods approached Indra, and Indra was actually going to attack Hanuman. But before he could even do that, someone else attacked Hanuman. Who was that? Airavat, the elephant. And what does Hanuman do? <laughs> he eats him as well. <laughs> That's a powerful shakti. You know, hardly in an endeavor, you just gobble them down, you know? Um, so Indra gets mad, Indra then uses his weapon. What's his weapon? Thunderbolt. Yeah, in, in Sanskrit? Vajra. Vajra, right? And he knocks uh, Lord Hanuman where? On the jaw. In the jaw. And that's why, you know what Hanuman means? Hanuman means jaw. And that's why his name is Hanuman. So when people call his name out, they can remember this wonderful pastime. Hanuman, jaw. So when he knocks him out, he goes unconscious. Who gets mad when Hanuman's unconscious? Why dead is vexed angry. He's angry. So what does he do? He actually uh, sucks all the air in the universe. So everyone's struggling to breathe. All the demigods are having panic attack and the demigods then go to who? Whenever they're in trouble, who do they go to? Brahma. Lord Brahma. And Brahma actually told them that, look, you actually offended the great uh, Vaishnava, so you should actually offer benediction to them. Now I'm going to share you with you guys the power and benediction the demigods bestow upon a Hanuman. Okay? So, oh my god, that's tiny. <laughs> Alright, so um, it's mentioned Lord Brahma gave him the benediction that he will live for as long as Brahma lives. How long does Brahma live? As long as the universe. Which is how long? March. 311 trillion, 40 trillion years. Okay, figure that one out. 
Okay, a long time basically. When someone asks me how long Brahman is, I just say long time because you're not wrong, right? <laughs> long time. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> Brahma told him that no one will be able to defeat you or kill you. Okay? Now, one could question that when he had a fight with who? When Hanuman went to Lanka, uh, he was um, burning things down. Who captured him? Indrajit. Indrajit was who? Son of Ravan. He was son of Ravan. So then someone could say that with that beneficial doesn't make sense. See, Hanuman had the ability to even defeat Indrajit, but just so that he could meet Ravan and have a discussion, he actually allowed himself to be caught and also respect Brahma's benediction which was going to injure with that weapon that he used. Okay? Uh, the third one, he said he would not be bound by laws of nature, so the modes doesn't affect him. Okay? Another benediction was a diamond necklace he gave and he announced that you will be the eternal servant of the Lord. That's what Brahma's benediction to Hanuman was. Agni says fire will not affect him and in the future, did that help him? Yes. Absolutely, it did. Okay, Indra, he would attain fame like himself and no weapon would be able to injure him. You know, nothing can harm him. Brihaspati gave him the knowledge of Ayurveda and all the fruits, plants and trees in the world. Was this relevant in his life? Yes. Why? Sanjeevani. Sanjeevani, helping Lakshmi. The sun gave him the Vedic knowledge. Okay, Dhanmantri gave him the healing touch. We know who Dhanmantri is, right? Yeah. Dhanmantri is the Lord who actually... Uh, where did Dhanmantri come from? Chaining of the North Ocean. Bishop Karma, very interesting, gave him unbelievable intelligence, clarity of thought and creativity. So when you look at Hanuman's life and all the struggles he went through, it seems like he had clarity of thought. He knew exactly what to do. You know? And last but not least, Vayu gave him the power of speed. Okay, so that's just a bit of an intro to Hanuman. So when I read this book, I extracted the A, B, C, D for overcoming negativity. Okay? Four lessons I extracted from uh, reading Hanuman's pastime. So the first A is actually association. Okay? And the principle I derive from this particular pastime is good association will bring the best in you, even in the most testing time as well. Okay? Does anyone know what this pastime is? What was happening here? He was trying to cross over Lanka because he was supposed to go and find Mother Sita. Okay, so what else is happening here? Who are the personalities you, you does anyone see? Jambavan. Okay, good. Jambavan. What was the story here? So here now, uh, the parties have been split around the world. So Griva has told everyone to go around the world to search Mother Sita. So he sends party north, south, east, west, and he sends a party with Hanuman, Anga and Jambavan to the south. They reach the ocean and now they're in a dilemma. Right? Uh, who helps them at this point? Sampati. Sampati. Sampati actually comes. Who's Sampati? Jatai's brother. Jatai's brother. So Sampati says, actually I saw Ravan take Sita across here and I can, even though Sampati was an old man, he had great vision. He could actually see right from the ocean to where Mother Sita was. And he could see, and he could see that his hundred Yojanas far away. So now, all the monkeys were in dilemma. How do we cross? Okay? So they start comparing each other's strength. One said I could jump one yojana. Once the other said I can jump 12 yojanas, 65 yojanas. Then one great personality said I can jump 100 yojana. Who was that? No, it was Hanuman. Anga. Anga says I can cross 100 yojanas. Everyone gets excited. But then he says, but. <laughs> and it's like, oh great, what's the but? Because I can cross 100 Yojanas, but I'm not sure if I have the strength to come back again. So they're back in dilemma. So at that time, the wise man Jambavan actually analyzes all the strength in his team. Okay? But he actually then spoke up to one person who was very silent. Who was that? Hanuman. What did he do? Reminded him. He reminded him of his power. Now, why did Hanuman forget his power? That's a bit strange, isn't it? He was, he was cursed to forget it because he was a very naughty child. He was a very naughty child. Hanuman's mentality was that by eating the sun, I got so much wonderful power. Imagine if I cause more havoc, I'll become more powerful. <laughs> that was his mentality. So then what Hanuman does, he was causing havoc like anything. You know? And all the sages got very angry and they cursed him that you will forget all your powers until the right time someone will remind you. And that was Jambavan. Jambavan then reminded of his hidden potential, and then Hanuman was very successful crossing over. You know? And this is what I found during my whole process 
Like um, when I surround myself with the right kind of people, it gave me the strength and energy to deal with all situation. And in fact, it made me see the so-called negative situation as a positive situation. And this is the power of association. And, and this is one of the key things that I'm, I know for a fact that even if I can't practice my sadhana, which Maharaj I am, just to clarify, <laughs> but I know one of my sa one saving grace is I know if I have the association of devotees and have good, strong relationship, even if I deviate, I will come back on the right track. Okay? So association is really key. And in fact, this moment when I went through this whole negativity actually helped me enhance the quality of my relationship with everyone around. Okay? And so therefore, when you have the right association, they empower you to actually, they bring about the best in you. Does that make sense? Okay? But it doesn't stop there. We then want to train ourselves in, in such a way that we can then empower others and help them tap into their hidden potential. Does that make sense? Right? So, I try to develop good relationships with people and what I do is I use a concept called NIC. Does anyone know what NIC is? Nice. <laughs> if you were pronouncing it, it's actually Nick. <laughs> but nice, we'll, we'll go with that. Actually, whenever I'm trying to develop a relationship, I try to find out three things from people. I try to find out their needs, I try to find out their interests, and I try to find out their concerns. Once I find these three things out, then I try to see what do I have in my capacity to help them overcome these things. Okay? And this is a technique I use everywhere I go, whether it's devotees or people I meet in the hospital or the nurses or whatever. You know, I try to get into a conversation where I try first we'll find out NIC. Because people don't remember what you tell them. They remember how you make them feel. Isn't it? So this is a very powerful technique which um, I use, which helped me to develop a good, deeper relationship. And one of the purpose of this retreat that Marge kindly helped us um, facilitate and you know, empower us was to actually develop deep, meaningful relationship. Sometimes we think we have deep relationship with devotees, but when I analyze my life, I actually don't know anything about them, isn't it? Like if you ask your best friend, like, you know, um, what's the best, happiest moment in your life? Or, you know, what was the last time where, you know, what's the proudest moment of your life? You wouldn't know. So how deep is your relationship? It can be quite superficial and shallow. So what I want to do is, I want devotees here to develop a deep relationship. Our time is short, but I have one exercise that I'd like to do with you guys, which will help us actually, um, develop deep relationships. So this is called the human bingo. We're going to play a game. Is that okay? Yeah. I'm okay. We're really excited. And you're going to get prizes as well. Really? No. Mark, what team won? Which team won again? Approved. Can you just take some of this and just uh, take one piece of paper. Um, and what I want you to do is just take one and then pass it out. And make sure you have a piece of uh, pen and pencil as well. Um, just take one pass along. Okay. So much for the treasure hunt, the winning team, the prize was basically they get an opportunity to skip lunch and chant extra rounds. <laughs> That's what the prize is. Okay, so uh, if you can see the piece of paper, has everyone got one? Okay, just put your hand up if you don't have it. All right, those who have a lot of bunch of papers, please can you pass them around? Okay. All right, so if you look at this, how many of you ever played bingo? Okay, obviously not gambling, right? Just for fun. Okay, good. Just to clarify. All right. So we're going to play something called Human Bingo, okay? And this is how it's going to work. The way Bingo works is that you have to actually, it's, it's like a game where you have numbers and you have to get numbers either horizontally, vertically, or diagonally. Does that make sense? Okay? I want you guys to stand up and walk around the room and you have to find answers to each of these questions and you write the person's name down and the answer to that question. Okay? Let me clarify. And I was like, what? Is it coming in? Relax, let me just finish. Alright? So if you look at the chart, the first one says, if you didn't have to sleep, what would you do with the extra time? Yeah? 
So I'll go up to, say, uh, Dilip, okay? So I'll speak to Dilip, hey, Dilip, how are you doing? Okay, great. Okay, if you, if, you had, if you didn't have to sleep, what would you do with the extra time? Whatever answer he gives me, say he says, I'd sleep more. <laughs> <laughs> I write down Dilip, and I write down the answer he wrote, sleep more. Then I move on to another person. I'll ask him another question. What is your favorite pastime from Shriman Bhagavatam and why? Write the person's name down and write down the answer briefly. Okay? And then what I want you to do is the first person who gets the horizontal, vertical, or diagonal to shout out bingo and you win. Is that clear? No. Okay, shall, shall we do it in Croatian? No, no. So, Mother Sasha, did you get it? Oh, right, okay, okay. So, so basically, if you get all names across, you win. Don't do random ones. I'm looking for people who've done straight across, straight down, or diagonal. Right, this will make it easy. I'll give you five minutes. Fill in yeah, as so much as you can. Whoever finishes this line first or that okay. one. Okay, any other questions? It's a winner. You have to go around yes. asking people these questions. And whenever you're different people, different, different questions, write the name down. Or you can Right, this, direction, this direction, yes. This direction or this. Huh? Okay, I have to find Ah, come on, man. You can show that. Yeah, 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 no, yes. So if we start now, we... Alright, time starts now. Give me five minutes. Find five to ten different people and find the answer to them.
Okay, happy shot. Thumbs up. Okay, thank you. Okay, her Krishna, please settle down. Okay, so. Alright, guys, you can settle down. Yo, go right now. Krishna, can you please behave? Can you come back? So, now I'm just cautious. The, the organizers told me I have to finish at 1.15. So this was supposed to be uh, an exercise that would actually... Uh, I just want to pull out, uh, read out funny ones, you know? Like, um, did you see any funny ones? Yeah. What? Shout them out. What would be the most amazing adventure that you've learned? No. What is the, something that a lot of people are obsessed with but you don't get the point of? Don't say poo-poo, because I'll be very upset. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. I have no idea. Okay. Yes, Marge? <laughs> Cell phones. Cell phones, okay. Yeah. <laughs> What's the point? Makes no sense, you know? So this is a great exercise I do to help you understand people very well, you know? And this is not an exercise just to do here. I want you guys to spend the rest of the few days going through this and asking people the same question. Try to get to know them, you know? Try to help understand. Like someone just told me, uh, what is your hidden talent? Someone said they do that maths. Okay, that's nice. <laughs> uh, someone's got a best-selling book. Who's that? You got a best-selling book? Check you out. What's the book? It's called The Burning Bride. The Burning Bride. If you guys want to check out Amazon. Is that right? Is that Amazon? Kindle. Okay, good. Kindle it. Kindle it out. All right, good. Yes. Oh, he's just stretching. <laughs> yes. Sorry? How do you get that? It's too hidden. It's too hidden. It's too hidden. Oh, it's too hidden. You can't find it. <laughs> you just need to hang around with the right people and they'll extract it for you. You know. So, is this useful? Yes. Yeah. This is a really great exercise you could do. You know. Um, you know, one of them is like, <laughs> what's the amazing thing you did that no one saw? You know that the last one said, what amazing thing did you do that no one was around to see? For me, it's making up this question paper. <laughs> Just so you know, right? I did it. <laughs> um, okay, so association is very key. If you have the right association, it will help you overcome negativities in life. Okay, let's look at B. B stands for balanced mind. Okay, wisdom, devotion, and dependency on the Lord will give you balanced mind, by which you will always make the correct decisions all the time. Hanuman is a perfect example. Have you noticed that Hanuman has gone through a lot of struggles? You know, and he always knows what to do at the right time. One of the reasons is why? Because he had knowledge. Okay, where did he learn his knowledge from? No, Surya did, right? So second time, he had his uh, eagerness to learn Vedic knowledge. So what he does is he goes and approaches Surya Dev. Surya Dev now sees Hanuman approaching him. What do you think is going through uh, Surya Dev's head? Yes, oh no, he's going to come and meet me again. But the Surya Dev sees that Hanuman is actually more pacified and he comes in a very submissive mood. You know, so Surya Dev then says, listen, my class is full, so I have no admission, I'm sorry. Hanuman said, don't worry, he was so eager to learn that... Now, I'm trying to picture this, I was trying to picture this. It's like a universe that's flying around, Surya Dev's abode, and there's no space in his classroom, which doesn't make sense to me. But Hanuman was so kind of enthusiastic, he would sit outside the classroom and actually hear everything Surya was saying, you know, and he was, uh, Hanuman's known as Shruti Dhar. Do you know what that means? You hear once and you remember it. Not once did Surya had to repeat anything, okay? So Hanuman was out there, he learned all the knowledge. And through that knowledge, he learned etiquette, culture, everything. So when you read Ramayana, you'll see Hanuman's approach and his sensitivity to all his interactions, okay? Like there's one point when Ram and Hanuman, when Ram and Lakshman first met Sugriva, 
So Vivya knew Han Ram was the king of Ayodhya, so he gives him a nice seat, you know, but he neglects Lakshman. Hanuman saw this and he felt so bad. So what he does is he got some branches from the tree and he made a wonderful seat for Lakshman. Now this was an offense on Sugriva's part. And what was his consequence? The consequence was that, you know when uh, Ram was helping Sugriva defeat Bali, right? So you know uh, Ram told Bali what? Sugriva, go and fight with Bali. Right? When you guys are fighting, I will shoot Bali. Do you remember that? Right? So then they're fighting, but what happens? Sugriva gets beaten up like anything. Right? And Sugriva's like, Ram, why didn't you shoot? What did Ram say? It looks similar. You guys both look similar. This was an external reason. Real reason is he got beaten up because of the offense of Lakshmi. <laughs> That's the real reason. Now, what was the rectification here? Then Ram says, I look, we gotta we gotta solve this. Why don't you get the garland of Lakshmi? So that way I can tell the difference. Right? So the offering of garland where Sugriva had to actually bow down to Lakshmi was a sign of repentance and Lord saw it as forgiveness. So then when he did that, then of course there was distinction and Ram killed Bali. Does that make sense? You know? But Hanuman was very sensitive. Even when you see in life, they say that there are a lot of temptations and obstacles, isn't there? But Hanuman was super fixed and determined. So when Hanuman was crossing over to go to Lanka, what's the first obstacle he came across? Do you remember? He's flying and he's going to Lanka. The first obstacle. No, not yet. Before that. Maharaj. Yes, Menika. Oh, one of them. I've got the name wrong. It was a mountain. Correct, Maharaj. And the story is really interesting. Back in the days, mountains had wings. <laughs> Can you imagine? They could just fly around. And so what happens back in the days, the mountains could actually go anywhere they want. And they used to abuse this power. So they would actually uh, land where there was human civilization. Indra gets angry. What does he do? He chops off the wings. And there's one particular mountain, this one. Uh, this mountain, she took shelter of who? By Varuna in the water, you know, and therefore, um, what happened was uh, when Hanuman was flying over, this mountain came up, and he told um, the the mountain told Hanuman that please come and rest here. You have all the facilities that you need to recruit, basically, you know. And and what did Hanuman do? Did he do that? It was temptation. He could enjoy. He could rest. He said, No, I'm just going to touch my feet and continue. Are there temptations in life? We have temptations all the time, you know? And therefore, when I was going through all of this thing, I did a lot of reading of Bhagavatam and Gita, and the first thing I learned was what on earth is negativity? Where is, what's the origin of negativity? Mind. It's the mind. Bhagavatam explains actually all suffering begins from where? The mind. So we really have to understand how does our mind function? So I'm going to quickly show you an interesting diagram which helped me understand the mind very nicely. So, okay, we'll just use this. Okay. Oh, no, it's okay, I'm quite loud. I'm quite loud, isn't it? Thank you. <laughs> okay, so what we're going to do is I'll give you an example that, how many of you ever done swimming? Swimming? What, what's a different way you can swim and explore the water and the ocean? Okay, uh, different other techniques. These are techniques by different methods, shall we say. So diving is one of them. There's something called scuba diving. What's, what's the next one? Snorkeling. And then there's another, anything else? So your mind is also like that. You have something called, um, what do you call it? Uh, scuba diving. Scuba diving is you're just touching the surface, isn't it? Right, so this is scuba diving. This is called your conscious mind. Okay, which means that you know exactly what's on the surface of your mind if we ask questions. Okay, snorkeling is you're going, no sorry, scuba diving you're going a bit deeper. This is called your subconscious mind. Okay, that's something where you have to contemplate, reflect, hypnotherapists use this to understand what's in your subconscious mind. And then deep down inside here is something called your unconscious mind. Okay, this is your unconscious mind. And this is called the David Attenborough region. You know who David Attenborough is? Yeah. The planet, you know, he's the guy who goes like into the areas of the world where no one goes. Okay? So this is what the mind is like. We have the conscious mind, subconscious mind, and you have the unconscious mind. It's in our unconscious mind where our pure identity is covered. Who you are, you know? And therefore, we have to understand the mind. So we understand the three aspects of our mind. Second aspect is what is the mind filled with? 
What's an ocean? A glass of water is filled with what? Water. Bubbles, right? These bubbles represent thoughts. Our mind is filled with thoughts. Who puts the thoughts into you? Mind. 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 No, who puts the thoughts into your mind? Yes. Okay, so uh, where was that? Okay, okay. So our mind is filled with thoughts. Okay, you have many different thoughts. How do thoughts get in in the first place? Okay, environment. Does environment play a role? Yeah. Mom plays a big role in, in, in the way it goes. So whenever you go out, you know, have you ever had a time? I remember when I was in the hospital and um, there's one nurse. The nurse was humming to a tune, okay? And then I'm listening subconsciously and then I start humming to that tune also. Mm-hmm. And you know what the tune was? It's a... Uh, you know that Frozen one? Was it Let It Rain? Oh, yes. Do you remember Let It Snow? Do you guys know? I see some people like, what are you talking about? But you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> right? I never consciously saw that music video or heard that music, but somehow that I know it. This is subconsciously, right? Things are poured into your consciousness, subconscious that we don't know it. The second way is what we purposely put into our mind. Does that make sense? There's the two ways we build the thoughts. Your mind is built of four kinds of thoughts. Okay? And you have to be cautious of what kind of thoughts am I putting in. What are these four kind of thoughts? You have positive thoughts, you have negative thoughts, you have something called necessary thoughts. This is your day-to-day to day to-do list. And the fourth one is called wasteful thoughts. Okay? Now if you look at your mind, what is your mind filled with mostly? Which categories? Wasteful and negative. Do you think if your mind is filled with wasteful and negative thoughts, your life will be very nice? No. But can we change this? Yeah, you can change it based on what you put in your thoughts, in your mind. And therefore, one of the biggest ways I find balance in your mind is reading. Our scriptures are really powerful. I was very surprised that when I was going through it, you know, when you're going through a crisis, you start reading scriptures in a whole new perspective. Okay? And there's so many different sections of Bhagavata, of Gita, of Chaitanya Charitamrita that helps us deal with life's challenges. And one of them is how to face adversities. Okay, so I want to share something that I found very interesting. In Bhagavatam, there's a section, um, there's a section, fourth canto, 19, chapter 34, verse, right? This is a section, sorry, it's not fourth canto. This is a uh, gender person, eighth canto, my bad. Okay, here, Prabhupada in the Purple writes 10 points how to deal with reversals in life. Okay, in 10 points. If anything negative you're going through in life, these are the 10 points to meditate on, which Prabhupada gives in the purple. He gives you three contemplation when the bad thing's happening, three responses, and two state of consciousness. Okay? So the five contemplation is, Prabhupada writes, so this is a story of who? Do you know who this story is of? The gender. The gender pastime. So this is a story where the gender now is being told who he was in his previous life. Who was in his previous life? King in the Junamaraj. Okay? King in Junamaraj was meditating in the forest. He was so deeply absorbed, he gets cursed. By who? It's not Durasa. Who, who curses um, in the Jumaran when he was meditating? Okay, that's your homework to figure out. Okay? I'm saying that because. Is it Agasta Muni Maharaj? Is it Agasta Muni who curses uh, in the Jumaran while he was meditating? No, uh, okay, I didn't figure that one out. I think it's Agasta Muni. So he curses him. Right? And then, this is the meditation Prabhupada writes that when adversities come, this is what you should do. The first thing is, Indra Maharaj saw that that was a desire of the Lord. Okay? They said, so whenever we go through something, understand that this is a desire of the Lord. Why? Because it's going to be blessings in the end. Okay? Third meditation is, maybe I did something in the past, a mistake. Right? I made a mistake sometime in the past, and now, um, you know, this mistake, I'm paying for it, but I'm only getting a token reaction. Okay, I'm only getting to a reaction. Krishna is so merciful that so in the Jumasin, I've just become an elephant. I could have become something worse. Okay, and this episode is for my purification. We're in this world, why? To get purified. Okay, so all these incidents is actually burning off our anarchists. Okay, how do you respond? So in the Jumasin continued his consistent seva. When he says, uh, so when in the was cursed, he continued his deity worship. When we go through negativity, the first thing we do is we give up our service. We maybe give up our chanting or reading or whatever. 
you know, but one thing we should do is continue. Indigenous Maharaj was unagitated, you know, by doing this process you remain unagitated and this is the most important thing, he continued being dependent on the Lord, he did not lose hope or faith in the Lord. And I'll be honest with you, one of the biggest, uh, best time, the most intense time when I chanted was during my second surgery when I had the liver surgery. That was the most intense because I was in pain everywhere, there were scars everywhere, you know, and I was like, there's so much inconveniences I was going through, but my chanting was ecstatic. Okay, it was really good. And I realized that actually, when you are really desperate, you take more shelter of Krishna. And that moment becomes very magical, you know? And therefore, you kind of look forward to, in one sense, negativity, because you've got a different approach. So this is very important, you know? So, and then most important thing is always have faith that Krishna cares. That is your love strength. And faith that Krishna protects. One of my favorite verses from the Gita is 9.22. Does anyone know that verse? Yes. So the English translation is basically this, that Krishna says, those who engage in devotional service, I carry what they like and I preserve what they have. Does that make sense? It's a very powerful verse. So whenever you're going through difficulties, understand that Krishna, whatever good you have, he's preserved it. But whatever you're lacking, he's going to give it to you. You know? So this was very interesting. So reading is a very powerful thing that helps me overcome negativity. Whenever I don't read, I'm spaced out <laughs> and things go wrong. You don't make the right decision. But by reading, you're actually connecting with Krishna. I was told, actually, one of the best ways to overcome loneliness is by reading scriptures. Why? Because you're directly associating with the characters that you're reading. Does that make sense? You're actually in, the, in that mood in one sense, if you're reading with that absorption. And that's a powerful way to overcome loneliness. You know, so, the balanced mind comes from reading, educating, uh, hearing shastras. C stands for contribution. When I look at Hanuman's life, I see his life was full of dedication and contribution to society. When his mother was meditating and performing austerities, her prayer, this was her prayer. She was praying that, please give me a son who would be the greatest hero to the, the world has ever seen and one who would assist humanity in ways unheard of. Okay? So our life is actually meant to be for contribution of others. In the Gita, what, pleases, what does Krishna say that pleases him the most? One who gives Krishna consciousness to others because that's the best benefit others can have. And therefore, I found that this whole cancer situation worked in my favor. Because when I was interacting with people in the cancer world, it's a whole new world out there. I saw that um, there were people who were in a far worse situation than I was. When you do chemotherapy, you're completely finished. You're whacked. You have no energy to do anything. I would go home, have mommy's cooking. <laughs> right? That helps. But I met certain cancer patients who have no one to look after them. They would go home on their own and they do everything on their own. So then they'll, you know, live off like canned food or instant food, microwave food, which is probably not good for the healing process, you know? And therefore, what I started doing is that um, I started doing something called, uh, so then this whole thing, I saw an opportunity for service because I, when I actually did this whole um, cancer thing, I wanted to do a thank you retreat all the doctors and patients that helped me in my first surgery. So I invited all these doctors, we had lunch, we did meditation, yoga, we taught a few philosophy. And then I, I came up with an idea that actually one of the nurses, uh, the head of the nurse actually said that what you offer to us here, a lot of cancer patients can benefit. You should do this more often. So then from this, I, I opened up a charity, it's called JD's Cancer Fund, where I collect money to do retreats like this so that other people can benefit, especially cancer patients, people with mental illness. Because this retreat gives you everything that a, a, a soul needs. We, we do something on the physical level, to emotional, social level, to spiritual level. So we give them a taste of all of this. You know? And so this is a great opportunity. A lot of doors are opening up just because I have cancer three times. I'm a monk. I can teach meditation, yoga, and so many people want to know, what did you do to overcome this? So I've got a short video I'd like to show everyone. This is, uh, yes, Shiri Maji. Can you just go for one second to those five points, three, four, three responses and the... Yeah, I can, we can send this out as an email, my PowerPoint, if that's easier. Okay. Yeah. Is that okay? We'll send this out so any, anything you need and the references we can give it to you as well. Is that okay? Um, so can I quickly show you the video just so you guys get an idea of what's happening? So we've done three retreats so far and the way the retreats work is that uh, I do I do uh, well-being retreat. So that you can set up. Yeah. 
Okay. So I did these well-being retreats, and we call it the well-being retreat. And the idea of the well-being retreat is you come and take a break from life. Take a step back and recharge, rejuvenate. Okay. And um, the idea is that you come, you chill out. I don't charge anyone for these retreats. So I did, I did this retreat, one second. I did this retreat for the corporates. I invite them, take a break, and do a lot of fun activities. And at the end, I say, look, I don't charge this for this retreat, but people give a donation. I'm doing fundraising, so I can do the same retreat for cancer patients. And then I use that money to do the same retreat for um, cancer patients. So this is a small video of the kind of activities that we do. I guess where we can play. Activity or service giving back. So when you sometimes you're so focused on a particular service that you forget about your problem. Have you heard of the saying, giving yourself, losing yourself in service to others? And it actually works. When we actually dovetail our life in serving others and giving them Christian conscious or whatever, it really does help you overcome the negativity and you become desensitized and it does not phase you out. You know, some of the people you saw in this video, uh, a lot of them were terminally ill, so that unfortunately have passed away. You know, and um, and this is the reason when I told Marge about this, you know, he thought you know this is a great cause. So why don't we do this retreat as a cancer fundraising? So most of you guys know that we did like a donation base. We tried to you know have recommended so we can cover the cost. But any luxury that's extra from donation from this retreat would go back to actually funding more retreats like this. Right now, because my fund is limited, I just do at the manner. But in the future, we'd like to take them to international um, centers like. Uh, different temples, Bradesh, even um, Buckland Hall, etc. You know, so contribution is very great. When we focus on mine in actually doing something for others, it's a great way to actually exert your energy in a positive way, and at the same time, you get the strength to deal with the negativity as well. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Right. So contribution is very powerful, and we'll see. Hanuman's life was full of contribution. 
He contributed to everyone. He contributed firstly to um, Mother Sita, right? Uh, for Lord Ram, because he went across to actually find Mother Sita. He helped and contributed um, to Sugriva, and of course Bharat. It was because of Hanuman Bharat stopped coming, uh, attempt to commit suicide. Did you know that? Right? Bharat actually made a vow that if Ram does not come back after 14 years, I'm going to commit suicide. So this was close. The war was over and the 14th year was almost about to be um, over. And Bharat was on the verge of committing suicide, giving his life, but Hanuman was there to rescue. And this comes to the next point, which is devotional prayers. Okay? Even though Hanuman was a smart guy, he was very smart and intelligent, there were times when even situations where he was bewildered and he had no choice but to do what? Pray. Take shelter of Krishna. So this is quite amazing. There's a section in this book which uh, is called The Dead End, and I want to read something. So when Hanuman went to Lanka, he was trying to find Mother Sita. He's looking around, looking around, and he could not find her. He was despondent. And then this is where negativity kicks in. He started thinking that maybe Raman killed Sita, or maybe Sita fell into the ocean uh, on the way coming to Lanka. Maybe Sita gave up her life because she could not bear the separation. You know, and he thought, oh my God, I'm going to be a failure. I failed. You know, if Sugriva finds out I failed, he's going to commit suicide. If Sugriva commits suicide, Ram's going to commit suicide because he has no hope finding Sita. If Ram commits suicide, Lakshman will commit suicide. Now, if Lakshman commits suicide, the whole Ayoga will become a crematorium, all because of me. Now, you can see the powerful effect of negativity. Do we go through that in life? Mm -hmm. Do we magnify our small problems? We do, unnecessarily. But Hanma, very interestingly, um, what he does is that uh, despondent Hanma wanted to end his life. Seeing a dead end in every direction, Hanma decided to take complete solace in Lord Ram's holy names. As he began chanting, now check this out, so he's chanting now because he, there's no other hope. Lord Ram's, as he was chanting Lord Ram's name, something interesting happened. Chandra, the moon, till then he was hidden behind the set of clouds and it peeped out. It seemed as uh, Chandra was interested in knowing who is chanting the name of Lord Ram. Chandra's rays revealed something that excited Hanuman. Down below was a alley that was completely hidden from the world. Though he had searched all over Lanka, he had completely missed this spot. As he glanced in that direction, he realized this is the most beautiful area in Lanka. This had to be the place where Ravana held Mother Sita captive. So he was very excited. He ran towards it. As he ran, the realization dawned in his mind. A dead end actually ends the illusion that you are in control of your goal and forces you to take shelter in higher powers that shine brilliantly and eager to give you the definite direction. And this is very interesting. When we come to dead end in our life, it's just an opportunity for us to understand we're not the controller and we have to seek higher shelter. And this is the reason why prayers is a torchlight that shows you the hidden possibilities in the dark environment of your despondent mind. So prayer is a very powerful way to also overcome negativity. And for me, prayer is basically a conversation you have with Krishna, basically. You know, um, every time if I go for my scan result, there's a part, I'll sit down and I'll just go through what's going in my mind and I'll write a letter. You know, it's like a letter you're corresponding to Krishna or whoever you connect well with. You know, and this is one practical exercise I like to show with, show, share with the devotees here that helped me and maybe it would help you also in how do you actually compose prayers. So the first prayer, the best way to do is reading Acharya's prayers. Okay, they're very powerful. Sachin Maharaj told me something very interesting. He told me before you go into your surgery, um, memorize and meditate on the prayers of surrender or Sharnagati by Bhaktivinoda Thakur. So, I, at one point I forgot Maharaj's <coughs> instruction. So when I was just about to go into the theatre room, I thought, oh my God, Maharaj told me to memorize a, a, a prayer. So lastminute.com, that's me. <laughs> I quickly memorized one prayer from Sharanagati. So I memorized it, then they injected me, boom, I was knocked out, I woke up. When I woke up, I was semi-conscious, okay? But when I woke up, I was hyperactive. I was shouting in the recovery room. Right? My hands were waving up. One of the reasons why? Because the first thing I remembered when I woke up was the prayer I memorized. You know? And I was shouting. I was actually thanking all the devotees who sent me emails and messages 
for you know my surgery. So I'm shouting, I'm thanking my doctors, and I'm thanking all the devotees here because you sent me an email. Sorry I didn't get an opportunity to reply, but thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> you know, and I'm shouting, and the nurses are worried that like, Mr. Shaw, can you calm down? He's causing havoc. I had all these cannulas coming out of me, you know, and um, but I was excited because I remember the prayer. That's what made me very excited, you know. In fact, I was so hyperactive. One of the nurses said that, you know what you told me the other day in your surgery? He said, you told one of the nurses that she looks very beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the thing is, I'm not the sort of person that would just chat up a nurse. I'm a monk, right? <laughs> and, um, and then the interesting thing is, she said that um, I would believe you if you open your eyes and tell me. <laughs> So I donn't always go in my head basically, you know? But prayer is a very powerful way that does help you deal with life situation. So what I want to do is this is one practical application you guys can take away with you. That I'm going to give you a template which will help you to write a prayer to Krishna or whoever you connect well with. And this is a template. So you, the template starts with like this. You write, Dear Lord Krishna or whoever you're connecting with, and there are four paragraphs to your letter. The first paragraph, you write, it starts off like this. I am so grateful to you because... Now here you list down all the things you're thankful for in life. So this is where you're expressing gratitude. Okay? That's your first paragraph. Think about all the things you're grateful for in life and write down and express it to Krishna. Second thing. Since I've taken up to the process of Krishna consciousness, I have... Dot, dot, dot. Now you write down, you write down all the things you have accomplished and you've achieved. Okay? Write everything down. Look at yourself when you first start Krishna Consciousness and how much progress and improvement you've made. Become aware and conscious of that. Third paragraph. But despite all the things you have given me, I still take you and the process for granted. Now you write down all your shortcomings and what you lack in your practice. You know, or maybe Krishna, I need to intensify my chanting, is very attentive. I need to increase my reading. You know, you write it all down, become conscious. And the last one, but now that I'm aware of these shortcomings and lacking, I will make a commitment to you that from this week onwards, I will uh, make a promise. Okay? I will, whatever that could be, you decide. And this letter gives you an opportunity to connect with Krishna, but most importantly, it gives you empowerment from Krishna also. So prayer is a very powerful way that you can actually uh, use to overcome um, challenges. And we learn all this from Hanuman. So just to summarize, um, the four ways I extracted from the life of Hanuman of how we deal with negativity is have good association. B, have balanced mind. Very important. Balanced mind comes from um, feeding your mind intelligence with, uh, what's the word, uh, wisdom, knowledge, and instructions from guru and other Vaishnavas. C, contribution. At the end of life, when you meet Prabhupada, and Prabhupada asks you, what did you do for Lord Chaitanya's movement? What answer would you like to give him? Okay, that's a meditation for you. And last but not least, D is devotional prayers. Okay, just fill your day with devotional prayers and you'll see that there will be no such thing as negativity like that. So, um, I want to thank you for your time. I hope that was useful. Uh, thank you, Maharaj, for giving the opportunity because he gave me an opportunity to absorb in Lord Ram and I got to hang around with him. Because they say when you read, you associate with them. You get that? Um, <laughs> And later on, I had another activity to test with your mind, but I guess we ran out of time. So, uh, we are running out of time? Yeah, we have. Okay, okay. So, so time's over. So, uh, any announcements from the MCs? Yeah, so